Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to this uh, live stream event um, about innovation ideas and case studies. Um, my name is Tom Beasley. I'm going to be the chair of this fantastic panel. Um, I am CEO of uh, Active Gloucestershire, a part of Sport England's extended workforce, a non executive director for Himalo, a social enterprise uh, working out of Bristol formerly head of Bristol Bar Science Park and one of the founders of Gloucestershire Science and Technology Park. I'm very excited about this event. Um, let's look at our panel. Would you like to introduce yourself? I get to choose. It's great being chair. John, would you like to go first? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so um, I'm John Keynes. I'm looking to learn a great deal from this discussion because as one of my colleagues said in some pre-match notes, I've been I guess the label entrepreneur, business guy uh, would stick. And I've been, a, you know, I haven't done innovation. It's something that's happened uh, around me, has preceded me. And that regard, I mean, this part of the world in the Southwest, I came down to be, I came down to be the financial director for a house building company. And if uh, the opportunity comes up, I may give a good example of innovation there, but more particularly, and for the next 25 years or so, I really ran, I started and ran uh, two B2B software uh, companies uh, in terms of people. Uh, one grew to 75, um, and then I then passed it on to the management team. The second one grew to over 500 with uh, operations in eight countries. That went really well, but it's still ancient history because for towards 20 years, I've been involved um, with various aspects of startups, emergent business, innovation centers, and so on. And that's sometimes been as um, a chairperson on behalf of funders, sometimes as a coach, quite often as investor. And um, apart from uh, those companies, and again, I hope one or two examples of innovation may come up there, I don't know about the rest of you, but I just worked it out. I must have seen about 10,000 business plans and business pitches at 500 a year for 20 years. <laughs> so, um, there must be something to learn from that lot. But for the time being, that's me. Thank you, Tom. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Oh, lots of exciting questions I've got already lined up. Um, Stephen, would you like to go next? Yes, I'm Steve Evans. I run Celtic Innovation Solutions and we're an innovation consultancy. So our, our goal in life is to work with clients to take their ideas, brainstorm the ideas, get them technically challenging and to a level that we feel that we can go for grant funding for to bring those ideas to market. We work, um, we, we write the bids and we can project manage the other side as well for clients. So we offer a turnkey solution, taking ideas through a business and we try to put them into a five, 10 year development cycle on different projects moving forward. And we work it quite successfully. There's, there's eight of us all together um, that work in it, and uh, we have a lot of fun. We're, some of us have been in the game for 30 years and, and in different guises, and it's, it's all about the idea and getting people a chance to take that idea forward. And somebody said to me once, there's never a stupid idea, talk, and let's, let's turn it into a, a, a top rate uh, development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's work around my screen. Nick, would you like to go next? Yeah, my name is Nick and I am the founder of the Ideas Agency. We are an innovation agency and we work with some of the smallest and largest brands in the world to help them unlock new opportunities in products, services and marketing strategies. Um, like I said, I've been doing it since 2013 and it's just a job. I absolutely, it's not even a job. I just love it. And I think it's uh, the best space you can be in because it's super exciting. So yeah, that's me. A, a definite trend of enjoying your job and having fun. I think that makes a big difference yeah. around innovation. Um, and, and finally, Luke. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes, uh, just a little bit about myself personally. Uh, I've been involved in startup businesses for a number of years now, probably 20, 25 years. Um, I haven't really bothered to count. Um, I am addicted to the whole startup environment. I love it. You know, the opportunity to grab an idea, drive it forward, get great minds together. Um, your wins and your successes are shared as a team. Your failures, you cry together. But as, as Nick was saying, that opportunity just to have fun and you meet the best people, um, you know, entrepreneurs and, and innovators, I thoroughly enjoy working with them because they think differently, they operate differently, 
um, and they're willing to take a risk. And I always think that the best kind of innovators are people that run with risk as opposed to run away from risk. We know the risks there, but how do you best manage it? And I think that's one of the things that I've had a lot of um, success at is running with the risk, uh, which is something that I've particularly enjoyed. So that's kind of my background. I mean, I've done things from football teams to restaurants to you know, smaller business to big media businesses um, and had a lot of fun in all of them and connected with some amazing people in all of them. My current uh, position, I am involved in an education company and we're looking to solve the disparity that uh, exists in the South African and African market where you've got massive have and have nots and there's that, that line is so clear to see. And our goal and our vision is to be, has been to see how we use technology to bridge that gap. We've had some really good successes to the point where we're now getting the departments of education to buy into our platforms, to involve themselves with what we do. But everything we did, we started with that innovation, we started with, with entrepreneurship and we brought it into the public sector with the view of saying, we're not gonna ask for permission. We're gonna go and build something that the people say, we want this, it's helping us, it's doing what we needed to do and then let the other things flow from there. Um, as, it, as we kind of went on this journey, it became more and more evident that we needed to also be a little bit more creative about the solutions that we looked to offer. And it meant that we had to go and start building hardware. It meant that we had to start conceptualizing different ideas. And it's taken us on a path that I have thoroughly enjoyed. It has been brilliant. I wouldn't have said that I was the world's strongest technology guy ever. Um, you know, it was just, I was always more of the people person. I like working with people and, and all the rest of it. But out of pure need, we developed some really good technology stuff, and we're very proud of the fact that some of that technology is now being used where, where kids can access digital education without the need for data, without those costs, and we're starting to break down those barriers. We've still got a long way to go, but we're thoroughly enjoying the trip so far. Exciting stuff. I've heard lots of great stuff already from our panel members, um, and we, we had a brief introduction before this uh, last June, and the conversation already started. But I'm going to start us off with a, with a question, and I think it just reflects on something that, um, that John had said, um, and it might be something that people on our panel just find naturally happens. Perhaps, you know, our panel um, are given the, have the gift of things just happening, of ideas just falling into their laps. But lots of businesses say, well, that's really difficult. It happened by luck, or I was in the right place at the right time. How can businesses take, take that, what they've learned, and recreate that success? Um, who would like to go first? How about you, Nick? Yeah, um, so it's often a challenge that we get. You'll get um, massive businesses, some of the big automotive firms that we work with, and to an extent, some of the smaller firms, um, continuing that kind of innovation and that growth. And we always come back to, you have, so the first thing is like the people, and sometimes the people say, well, we're not really creative. And so we put in uh, various processes and we take some various ideation techniques, right? That will help generate the, the, the ideas. Um, but prior to that, there's the question. And throughout our lives, we've been, as through our education, we've been taught to think in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. um, so we would come up to a solution, let's say a question is pitched to us and it's like, what does five plus five equal? We're typically taught in that way. And the key to generating great ideas is a great problem. And so that question is a linear question and has one answer. And the key to great ideas and starting the whole process is reframing that to what two numbers add up to 10? Because as soon as you reframe the question, suddenly there's many solutions. And then taking their teams through various ideation processes that you can use to unlock new opportunities because we're all born creative right as a species if you go back 60,000 years there's art on walls in caves um you know like i say dating back 60,000 years and we learned to feed ourselves through agriculture 10,000 years ago so inherently as a species we are creative and so when you look at brands like Tesla and when you look at brands like Pixar and Google they don't just throw their teams in a room and say come up with a great idea they give them tools and processes and so that's what we do we work with like I say some of the biggest brands in the world and some of the smallest brands in the world we run them through processes we use our own creativity as well and we produce some um, new solutions so that's how you do it really the start is the coming up with a great problem 
Right. And so it sounds really exciting. I've got lots of other questions teed up. Uh, so, John, you, it's it's you sort of alluded, I think, to that you've been in a really good place where you've, you've seen these ideas. Do you think it's something that um, certain people have naturally that ability to grasp ideas and take them forward? Um, is it luck um, or their skills involved with it? And can it be learned? Well, um, well, I think the, um, well, the, 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 there's a difference there, isn't there, between um, creating and utilising the, the innovation um, mm. as such. Um, and, uh, well, Nick's given us a great start. I mean, everyone can do both of those things and whether or not they do has got a lot to do with attitude and belief or at least the removal of limiting uh, beliefs um, as, as such. Um, one of the things I always try and do with um, managing directors or equivalents that I'm coaching is to uh, help them to get out to get out more. Uh, really big, really big issue for me in that regard. Uh, a lot of businesses is just everyone. You know, you, you know what I'm going to say: the firefighting, getting their heads down on today's operation tied up inside their own business, all those sort of things. Um, it's only actually by getting out in the relevant community, I call the market, your market a community, uh, relevant experts, competitors and so on, that um, it's not, actually I shouldn't say the only, I'll come back to that, mm. but it's in that sort of way that you really stimulate um, the ideas, um, that can lead to solutions um, to requirements very helpfully. It can uh, lead to ideas and connections that um, didn't exist already. And if you're more at the business entrepreneurial end, then um, uh, you, you'll recognize, oh, these guys are doing this or they're coming up with this sort of technology or whatever it may be. I know a bunch of customers that can use that or something that's equivalent um to it so you know these things can and do happen um by uh, by luck but you can turn all of that into processes and into an approach broadly speaking there we're talking about high probability of innovation versus low probability of innovation we all know that you know um is it the uh, the monkey can type up Shakespeare given long enough and that sort of thing, but that's generally not what we're about uh, in business. So let's be more systematic about creating the opportunities to uh, pick up either on, well, anything across that spectrum of the, the creative innovatory uh, world. Get out there more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds good. And, it, and it's interesting about the systems and processes, and perhaps we'll come back and look at some of those things in, in a bit. Uh, Stephen, it, is it, you obviously work with a lot of businesses who have been out there innovated and perhaps have got to that stage where they've got their idea and they want to move that forward. Would you say there's a trend amongst those that are successful? Now, who's the sort of typical success? What do they look like? How do they sound? How do they work? What do they feel? I think it's, it's, it's an attitude thing within the business, I think. Um, when, I, when I first start working with clients, sometimes you've got, to, you've got to force them into it a little bit to make them think that way. And the way we do that to get a typical client is we go into a business, we will talk to everybody in the business at all levels because there's some cracking ideas further down the chain within the business. Given a good example, as I work with a client, he makes... He, I can tell you what he makes, I can't tell you the client, obviously, but he makes um, food trays for takeaways. And he'd lost the ability to innovate within the, within the team. They grow in the business, they put an innovation manager in place and a small team, and they just lost it. They, they didn't know how to do it. So we came in, we started brainstorming with them, and we started talking to some of the guys off the shop floor for different ideas. So we had a brainstorming session, we brought them in, and they turned over about six million they were about 80 staff so a nice size of business growing and we sat down started brainstorming the ideas and the two guys off the shop floor who weren't part of the click in effect came up with some fantastic ideas to the fact that at the end of the meeting the mansion director turned around to these two guys and said you're not on the shop floor on monday morning and they looked at each other 
who are now working as part of the innovation team. They, we then work with them to develop those ideas further. And that's what makes a good business. They prepare to look across the whole platform within the organization. I got a typical one, but I work with one client and I started working with the owner and we did some what we call HMRC R&D tax credit claims, got some money back for him. And he had a very, very clever idea. And he's, he's a 2 million business, 20 staff. He used that money. He didn't just throw it away within the business. He used that money that came back to set up an R&D center, bought some staff in some equipment, and he was self-generating R&D ideas. That was the start of the journey with him. It got them into the journey. Now, when I walk in there, they talk tech. They don't talk about the business. They talk, what can I can do next in tech? And we're on the third project with them. And uh, there's another two stacking up behind. It's all about changing the attitude in the business to look at where they want to be in five years' time. And if you get the clients who think that way, um, you get them. Others that don't think that way, they will be still doing it, think talking about their idea, not actually doing it. And it is all taking risk. Risk is healthy. These the innovation funders like risk. They like technical risk. And therefore, you've got to, you've got to find that. And to... Uh, Get them to think in a different way that risk is healthy. It's very difficult to do sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting that element of risk. It's really, really interesting. Look, can we can we explore that a bit more? I'm going to call you a serial entrepreneur, and I think that describes you well. So I hope that's okay. Um, so you've obviously had to manage some of that risk, is going through, or, or numerous times. And and you, before the meeting, you told us some of the things that you've been involved with, which sound really exciting. And the risk that's different in different sectors and different environments. How do you approach that and how do you take people with you? Yeah, I think it's 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 very interesting if you look at, at what my three panelists have all said. I mean, Nick started off with talking about um, you know, reframing the question, which I think is massively important. I think Nick kind of nailed it right on the head there, just out, out of the gate, mm -hmm. in that when you start thinking differently, and I, and I love the way he posed the questions, we know five plus five equals 10, but what are the other the other variables? And then, you know, when people start thinking about that, but you, you've you changed the conversation, so you've got people thinking slightly differently. Then you go to what John was talking about, and he was saying, you know, getting out there and not just being stuck in your in your your area of looking at, at, at what's around. And then you go to what Stephen has just said, which is, where they found this innovation within the business that people weren't talking to. And there's one kind of thread that just runs through that, and that's communication amongst everybody, but framing the question in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think often, you know, we think to ourselves, we're not innovators in the same, same way as we think of ourselves as not being salespeople. How many people do you know say, oh, I can't sell? I can't sell. Yet they marry, they have children, they have a job, they have they've they've spent their life selling kind of a version of themselves or, you know, to get themselves to a particular point. And I think, you know, if you go to what Nick's saying is I agree with him wholeheartedly that innovation does exist within people and within organizations. And it's interesting that in, in Stephen's cases where he found the innovation, it came from asking outside of, you know, the, the, the click, as, as he called it, which was really fascinating. But I think the risk can be mitigated to a large degree when you are asking those questions internally. And the risk is mitigated when you understand the problem well. Because if you don't understand the problem well enough, you're going to be making some assumptions and going down some really dark roads and, and finding yourself in, in a bit of a problem. But if you truly and genuinely understand the, the solution and you understand, well, you understand the problem and then know that your solution solves that problem. But I think one added element to it is are people prepared to pay for that solution? Mm -hmm. So in other words, are you solving a big enough problem that people are saying, yeah, I'm actually willing to go to pocket to, to solve this particular problem. And I think that's where you manage the risk. And that's the running with the risk part that I was talking about. It's because now you're in a situation where you truly understand the problem, you've come up with a solution, and you've got indicators that say that people are prepared to pay for the solution. And if you're going to then take that product into the marketplace, I think you're running with risk because you've done... There's no guarantees of success. We all know that within this innovation space, they, they never are. But I think you've you've got a lot of the a lot of the risk factors have been taken care of if you've got those in line. Yeah, that, that, that element of people have being a market and people wanting to wanting to buy or pay for whatever service or product that you're making is really important, isn't it? Um, 
it's really good, I think, um, at this point, perhaps to give some examples, uh, you know, where, you know, the markets perhaps where we perhaps didn't know existed beforehand or products that have been developed that didn't know existed, perhaps using resources that we didn't think were there. Has anyone got any examples of something that's a bit unusual, perhaps, that, um, that we can explain uh, just for our listeners to get a bit of a feel for something, something different? Okay, here we go. Uh, I work with a diamond jewellery company. And you won't find them on the high street. They're tucked away in an industrial estate. They turn three million. Uh, they've got 20 staff. Two owners are in their 60s. Two daughters in the business and son-in-law. So a nice family business and growing. You make customized jewelry to your design. And I've known them for quite a while. Did some work with them. And the owner asked me, Steve, look at our business. Bring some tech into this business because diamond jewelry tends to be non-technical in lots mm -hmm. of ways. So I said, take me through your process then, please. And he said, well, somebody comes in, we sit them down, and we design a ring on the screen, for instance. What precious metals, what settings, what jewellery. And he said, and these famous words come up from me. He said, that's when I start losing money, Steve. I said, what do you mean losing money? You're paying thousands for this service. He said, well, they come back for a fitting of that ring five weeks later, and they put on their finger, they don't like the look of it, it doesn't suit the hand, the colour's not right, the weight is too, too much, and so on. I have to modify it. Every time I modify it, I'm losing money. Can you solve that one, please, Steve? That was a, you know, one of those. So I got them into an augmented reality project where your hand appeared on the screen, your wrinkle, your knuckle, the ring is slotted over on the screen, and you can turn it 360 degrees and see it in situ. We've done it. It's worked, and they use that today, and they sell it within their industry. And it's reduced the rework down to 20%. So once I got the hook onto them, I said, right, well, we need to look at a five-year development cycle, you guys. You know, you just can't stop on one project. So we said, well, five weeks to make the ring is, and, and, and the jewelry is too long. Why can't we use 3D printing technology to print the precious metals? And I work with problems. I need problems to solve. And the owner said to me, it can't be done, Steve. It's known in the industry. When you layer precious metals, they become porous and they shatter. So that was the base of a bid that we put together, brought in a good university to help us. And we won 440,000 from Innovate UK, UK government, to solve that problem. So we did early phase um, prototype work. We've done it. We've proved it works. And uh, now we're now looking at a development, again, which should be funded for industrial research to take that early stage development and turn it into a desktop unit. Now, the funny story that ends, I can end with is I went, walked in the, into the, um, the company um, about a year back and I said, it went to the owner's office and there's thousands of diamonds on his desk. I said, well, what's all this? About my delivery from De Beers, he said, I'm sorting my diamonds. And he's happy with diamond jewellery. I went to walk out of his office and his daughter caught me. She'll be the next MD when they retire. Steve, she said, I worked out what you're doing. I said, what's that? You're turning us into a tech company, aren't you? Exactly right. What we're doing is taking the base of diamond jewellery and then making the tech to go with it. And they'll be selling that around the world and making more money on it. So that's, that's the difference. We now got another two projects lined up. And we've got another five crazy ideas they've come up with. So I've got them thinking tech. I've got them thinking the base is diamond jewelry, but they are thinking tech all the time for the next development. We've now got a 10-year development cycle with them. So that's the story I, I play with. That's a great example. We have a really, really good example. Are there any others? I think the well, thing... Oh, sorry. So after you go. I was just going to say, it was really interesting that what Steve said there was effectively he's redefined what their company serves so they no longer serve well they do serve jewelry but fundamentally they are a, they're a tech service right um and that's really interesting when you ask an organization what do you think you do because as soon as you start redefining what they do and getting them to redefine what they do it can lead to multiple different yeah streams right and one example is um we were working with a really, well, the most luxurious car manufacturer you can imagine. And their challenge was around um, getting 200 high net worth young individuals to um, an event in Sardinia. And uh, 
so they had all these agencies come in and pitch them, you know, things like invites in case in mahogany boxes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we got the question and we said, do you know what? You're not, you're not serving luxury vehicles. What you are serving is almost like it's termed peacocking, but allowing the, your customer to feel good about themselves and show everyone else how, how impressive they are. And so what we did was say, right, what we're going to do is we're not going to do standard invites. We're going to print huge, wide format, uh, well, limited edition runs of art. And these are going to be the invites and they're going to get delivered to the doors of the people that you want to uh, deliver to the apartments or the houses of the people you want to attract to your event. And the whole point of it is not so that the invite just gets shoved in a drawer and forgotten about. The point of it is that they are then able to use the piece of art as a talking point because if they left out an invite on their side of their whatever their uh, huge kitchen island you know it's almost like that's a bit boastful but to be able to say oh yeah no that was given to us by this manufacturer and we've been invited to this exclusive event and it builds a conversation about the brand within the home of that of the per individual and their peer group mm -hmm. and so i think um yeah, when Steve was talking about redefining, redefining is really important. Um, yeah. Another great example. Yeah, to back it up, you, what you do, you give, you give them the lead, you lead them into it and you let them pick up on it. Because no, I don't have to talk, I don't have to go and force it with them. They're coming out with these ideas. And we just do the brainstorm against the ideas for the next generation. And the ideas are coming everywhere with them. Mm -hmm. and that's just one company. I'm doing that with most of my companies. Ideally. It's about creating that space, isn't it, in that environment? I think, John, you were going to come in. Yeah, I was intentionally going to do a little bit of a, a throwback, a sort of pre-technology example I alluded to when I joined that house building company. Mm. I think I mentioned, um, oh, but note, note that I call it a house building company. That shows that it's 1980 vintage because they've long since been residential developers or whatever. But when I went into that uh, company, the whole house building industry um, was really an offshoot of construction, of civil engineering. It was a corner of Wimpy's or J.D. Lang's or whatever uh, it may be. And um, I was in a bit of a, uh, a maverick company, really. We were a house building company with no surveyors when surveyors ruled the roost. And what happened on a typical site? was that, um, let's say, late Friday morning, because the brickies didn't work on Friday afternoons, um, the um, leather-elbowed quantity surveyor would go out and he'd measure up how many bricks have been laid in the previous week. And I make it 6,200. And the brickie with those prop forward muscles, Steve, would say, mm. oh, we made it 7,600 or whatever it may be. And also, we had to carry these lintels across the road. That's for another five or each. So on every plot, on every site, with 20 tra 10 trades, I'm exaggerating, there'd be those negotiations every week. So uh, who won most of them? Whose livelihood with it was it? Who was committed? And why did those cost estimates go so badly wrong? Well, this company, Westbury Homes, it's been sold to a bigger... I mean, it reached a billion quid, so it didn't do badly. Um, but they reasoned that once a house was out of the ground, the foundations were there, it was a production line. Mm. They thought about it as a production line with, I remember very clear, 39 operations to complete the house. And from then and going on to more, in a, so, so, so now the bricklayer will get the job to do this um, phase of 20 houses at a particular price a price that was a significant premium above the apparent cost done previously, but um, they only submitted the green ticket that we gave them for each plot when it was absolutely finished. Not 99% finished, because that's no good, uh, particularly if you're gonna put a roof on top, that it was absolutely finished. And in which case uh, we take that, we do the admin, they weren't very good at admin, and we pay them the following Thursday. Why am I saying all that? I think it's a fantastic example of you know, seeing a problem. Note also that it's internal. 
It's not for the outside. It's our problem. What are we going to do about it? So uh, not myself, but someone else came up with this sort of thinking. And uh, guess what? We became the lowest cost house builder in the industry. Um, there'd be at least half a dozen tradespeople that went on to become the players. Because we helped them with their admin and their planning and the other stuff they weren't good at. We just took that industry and took it from scratch, an empty factory, as opposed just to just building on traditional methods. So I hope that illustrates that you don't need to be um, high, high, highly creative in the arts and design sense or highly technological um, to come up with ideas. The um, role of amateurs versus experts is something we might discuss later, but I think I should hand over. Oh, no, that sounds good. Well, that's teed up another conversation, which is good. And I think you're right, that bit about uh, innovation taking all forms at, at all levels in the business and encouraging that and what can happen. And we've seen some good examples. And I'm sure Luke's going to give us another one. Well, <clears throat> you know, we've had lots and lots of different, different experiences. And I think one of the things that um, when we were talking about understanding the problem, I want to give you an example of where, the, where it didn't go particularly well because we under, we under sort of defined the incorrect problem. Um, it was part of my football days when, uh, and I'm very passionate about my football, but the, we had a, a kind of a, a situation where a lot of uh, foreign-based players were getting quite excited about the league in South Africa and it was an opportunity to bring these guys in. And it was clear that the marketplace was looking for these uh, for these players. They had a different technique, a different way, and a different strength and things like that. And we identified an opportunity to, to bring the guys in. And we started doing so. What we didn't appreciate was that there were a number of cultural hurdles and things like that which needed to be overcome in order to integrate these players properly into the environment. So the business part of it worked fairly well. But unfortunately, the guys didn't stick because we didn't understand the problem deep enough. We hadn't run through the whole process. And I think that was one of the examples that I just want to highlight is when you haven't done all your homework, or you don't understand the depth of the other layers of problems that are going to come, that a business won't necessarily be that successful. And it really, it, again, it comes down to understanding that problem and, and, you know, if people are going to pay for it. But that was one of my lessons, which... It was a painful one, but I still thoroughly enjoyed it because I got to kick a ball around with a couple of really decent players at one stage, so it wasn't too bad. That's great, thank you. So one of the questions we had posed by an audience member um, beforehand was how, how you get a company to innovate and how do you encourage innovation? Um, and I think we've, we've done that quite well. Um, so just picking up on some of the things which I'm certain our audience members will be asking, um, it's definitely around when you've got an idea, how you fund it. And I know... Steve, you, you mentioned Innovate UK. Uh, could you tell us a bit about what their role is and how Innovate UK can help with, with funding some of that work? Yes, yeah, certainly. Innovate UK are part of the UK government and it's the main innovation funding arm for the UK. They run what they call competitions on various sectors. The, the one I tend to do a lot of work in is called SMART, which is an open competition. That means any idea for any genre can be put into it. And they run competitions every two to three months. And the next one I'm writing bids for is the 26th of May. And that particular fund is 25 million in the pot this time it will run. And they fund in projects. If it's something that's a very early stage idea, you've got the idea, you want to bring a, a proof of concept out to prove the market and prove that you can do it. They fund, they can fund up to half a million. You need partners, you need consortium partners for that sort of level of funding. But it's anywhere on the track, 50,000, 100,000, to develop that idea. But it's got to be technically challenging. That's the key. Mm -hmm. The next level is something called industrial research. It's where you've got that proof of concept. You want to take it now next to market. You can't call it commercialization. It's a next to market prototype. And you can get up to 2 million in funding. It's funded at, for SMEs at 70%. So for every 100,000 you ask for, there's 70,000 cash. Universities can come in on it with you as a, as a partner and they get funded at 100% rate. And large companies can come in and they get funded at a lower percentage. It's all about that. It's all about how difficult the idea is and working it through, making it technically challenging for them to say yes. Um, the, fund, the, the round, I had a round run... Um, from November, we put five bids in for clients. We won three and had two rejected. The two that had rejected were 
scored 79 and 78, and the pass mark was about 81. So we're now reassessing those, making the slight changes and put them back in for the May 26 deadline. And we will win them a second time for those clients. And it's, it's easy. It's not, I would say it's easy. Once you get a project awarded, the running of the project is very easy. You can make it easy. They will. They obviously will put a project manager on their side to, to look after the money, but we can we can manage that out and support it. But Innovate UK, via the government, the government has said we've got to innovate as a country. They want companies to get IP. They want companies to get patents and take on the world, and they're using Innovate UK as the channel to do it. There's also money in Welsh government. Fair to say, there's money there. It's getting less as we move on because of. Um, it was European funded money, European funded money, so that's going to run out. So the main funding channel is Innovate UK. Great, thank you. And it just shows you know, that it isn't always just internally that you have to find the, the, the money uh, and resource to, to make these sorts of things happen. So, um, but how do you choose an idea? I mean, if you've got an idea, perhaps you've, you've done that, perhaps you're, you're an entrepreneurial uh, business owner or someone working in a business and you've convinced uh, the rest of the business to go with it. How do you choose whether it's an idea you're going to take forward, Nick? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, one of the way there are various techniques you can use, actually. Um, there are things like filtering where you would set out a list of criteria for the idea to meet and then you score each of those criteria out of 10. And you'll find that as you run your ideas through this filter, some of the ones that you perhaps thought weren't as strong as some of the other ideas maybe rise to the top because they meet um, meet some of the ideas. I think the key is how do you choose is create a really rough and dirty version of an idea. Once you've ran it through the filter, create the roughest and dirtiest version of that idea uh, as a prototype. So to give you an example, mm -hmm. um, Mark Randolph from Netflix, he's the co-founder of Netflix, right? And he says, I always get entrepreneurs coming up to me and um, saying, you know, I've got this great idea, but I need an app developer. So this woman came to him and said, I've got a great idea for peer-to-peer -peer lending of clothes, mm. um, but I need an app developer. I need to get a designer. I need to get all these different things together. I need to get loads of investment for it. And he said, no, no, what, what you actually need is a piece of paper, a Sharpie and some sellotape. And he said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, your idea, you've got an idea, but you need to be able to test it. And so he said, just write on your door, women's clothes for hire. And he goes, you put that on for a week, you get to see if there's any demand there. If there is people that come in and say, yeah, I'd like to hire some clothes, you understand the consumer fit, you understand how they feel about taking the product, you understand about pricing, you can then understand about um, when they return the clothes, you getting back um, dirty clothes and having to pay for dry cleaning and then you can take that feedback to an investor and you go from going I have an idea and I want some of your money to I've discovered that x and I have discovered x is far more powerful than oh yeah I've got this idea that I'm never gonna do anything about can you just give me some money so I can do something about it yeah it's yeah. definitely something you see isn't it very common that people have an idea and they, they haven't done it yet but even if you've just done it a bit even just a bit it does prove that concept. So I think I think that's something really valuable. Now, Steve, will you come in? Yeah, I can back up on that. What you find is a lot of businesses, when they first start, they have the idea and they think it's the best idea since sliced bread. And you've got sometimes you've got to tell them face, you've got to tell them blankly that it's not good enough. And you have to work with them on it. But a lot of them think they need to go to and find an investor to come in to invest in the business to get that idea forward. But what you, I find with all these companies, they're not investor ready. Mm. Go down the grant funding route, get that dirty prototype out so they go, they got something to show and tell, and then look for an investor because the investor then will come in at a, a better rate and take less ownership of the business. Right? I've seen so many times where uh, I've sat in a, in a meeting with 30 fintech financial services companies, all one investor, all an investor. And a year later, out of the 30, 15 were owned by the investors rather than the company. They've lost control. It's, it's, it's a balancing act. But yeah, the idea of, of doing a duty prototype at first stage to get something off and check the market. But it's as simple as if you painted it red, they would buy it. Because it's green, they won't buy it. 
could be as simple as that, but you've got to work that out. Come on to the investment piece, which I think is really interesting. Uh, we've we talked, and I think you've, you've linked spectacularly well for me there, Steve, to, to my next question, which I had teed up. With, we've talked really so far about quite big ideas and quite dramatic ideas that have made millions and millions of pounds and transformed businesses. But do good ideas and good innovation, does it always have to be big, Luke? Definitely not. Definitely, definitely not. You know, if everyone's going to sit around waiting for the big idea, you're going to be sitting for a long time. And I always find that action, um, you know, just taking small steps of action and heading down a particular path, because none of us know where the path's going to go. I'm sure when, when Nick started out and said, this is what we're going to do, it evolves every day, you know, and it changes every day and it becomes better every day and you become, you know, you enjoy it more and, and you learn more in the process. And I think the action is the key part. But finding an idea, and an idea can be quite simple in the sense of, I think I can do it better because I'm more committed to doing it, or mm. I can do it slightly cheaper. And I know uh, often we talk not about, about doing things cheaper anymore because um, there, there's a little bit of a, a negative connotation around that. But I don't necessarily think that that's the case. If I can offer um, an improved service by adopting technology and offering it cheaper, maybe that's an easy way of doing it. So I don't have to reinvent the market. Maybe there's just one or two processes that I can eliminate within the thing that were costing me money, much like John was talking about earlier, um, use that little bit of, and then, you know, maybe that's where I, so maybe I'm not spending as much money as my competitors are, and therefore I can reduce my costing. So it doesn't have to be a massive idea. It can be a really small and simple idea. But I also just wanted to comment, you know, Nick and, and Stephen were just talking about, you know, there's this process of getting a, um, you know, just getting a product, something rugged and dirty into the marketplace. Mm. And I haven't had a lot of time here in, in the UK as yet, but one of the things that I'm fascinated by is that there's a huge amount of support for business, for innovators and things like grant funding and that, which in my typical markets in South Africa, we haven't found to be the case. And I would encourage every innovator to get a hold of somebody like Stephen, talk to them, use this expertise, use the grant funding to try and get these, these programs off the ground, because I've no doubt that there'll also be a lot of support in terms of how things should be run, where a lot of people have an idea, but actually getting it to, you know, to work and, and building those prototypes and things can also be a challenge. And it's an amazing resource that this country has. And, and as I think Stephen mentioned, you know, the UK being the, the center of the world, I don't know why it isn't, because ever since I've gotten here, the people are brilliant. The ideas are brilliant. The support's excellent. There is so much opportunity. And I'd really just say to any innovator, go and speak to someone like Stephen, get your idea in, get some grant funding behind it, back yourself. Um, and then before you go and speak to investors, because the investors are often not necessarily the people you want to be working with long term, in some instances, not always. That's that's great. It's, there's no excuse for us not all to be innovators. I've, I'm already starting to drop down the things I'm going to be doing different. Um, but there is something, uh, John, you've already alluded to it in about kind of feeling like I, you know, should I, I should be the expert in my business if I'm going to be bringing in some technology? Don't I need to be the expert, or or is it okay being an amateur? Um. Well, first of all, if you're leading a business. Um, at least one legendary business guy, chief executive, now very much out of fashion, to be fair, and I think rightly, Jack Welsh, who built up General Electric. If you're the smartest guy, in the, if you're the boss and the smartest guy in the room, you're a jackass, because you want to employ smarter people. So, um, uh, you know, so often it's the case, and, it's, and I just love businesses where, you know, the owner, founder, chief exec is in love with what they they do. It's a very healthy, mm. uh, healthy thing in, uh, indeed. But that doesn't necessitate them being the expert. Uh, those jewelers and that technology, Steve, uh, quite a difficult transition to sort of uh, make. So recognize that. But I, I really uh, so strongly suggest that our audience listen really carefully to things that are being said. I totally agree with this minimum viable product, um, notice on a door, evidence that the, uh, that the fish will bite, that the buyer will buy if we come up with something. But even more in this context, with the idea of using facilitators, outside people to draw out, to be professionals in innovation, to draw out whatever is already uh, in the other resources that are accessible. And after that, I think it then depends on the um, 
we, we want to mix, don't we? Pretty difficult being a, a medical innovator coming up with a, a COVID vaccine if, you, if you're an amateur. But sometimes amateurs, outsiders, whether it's in the process or the subject, can make the connections that other people don't, which is why I go back in a way to uh, getting out there more and uh, um, just listening to what people say and making those connections. Yeah, I, I, I can back that up. I, I work with a client. He's got a very successful business. He runs a week, got about 100 staff. He's turning a lot of money. And he said, I run the perfect business, Steve. He's in his 60s. I step out of my business two days a week and let them run the business. And I chuck mud against the wall and see what sticks. He has two or three people who are just ideas guys that doesn't work for him. And he throws them, they throw him ideas every so often. And he said, for every every five I get in, two actually make me money. And that's how he does. He does the innovation. He does, he's, he's not the expert in it, but he's, he's a facilitator to drive that forward. And he's in his 60s now. And I keep saying, Mike, when are you going to retire? I'll never retire, Steve. I'll, go, I'll end up going down to one day a week. But he, he's built his business to allow it to operate okay without him being there. And he can carry on doing the crazy stuff. And those crazy things, he's cementing that business for the next 20 years. And he is something special. I don't see that very often. I see him now and again, but he is something special. I think it comes back to that point, where I think, where we started, didn't it? Where, where being idea, being innovative, generating ideas is all about having fun, enjoying work and seeing what happens as a result. Um, exactly. We, which is great. So we've got about 12 minutes left and uh, we've spoken a bit about it. So I don't want to miss the opportunity uh, to talk a bit more about investment and external investment and, and how that can be can work. We've heard some of the pitfalls um, and what can go wrong. Uh, but what are the opportunities as well? So um, would anyone like to just give you an example of where internal external investment can help a product or service come to market um, and where that's helped, but also what are some more of the pitfalls? I, I think it, it's just how I know I've got a client, I had a couple of clients where they've done their innovation and we call it Death Valley, something where you've done your innovation, you know what to commercialize it, you want to get it into the market. And you go to the bank to borrow money and the bank says, oh, it's still innovation, I'm, I'm a bit of fee with this, I can't fund you or make it easy for payment. So I've had that case happen. And people like um, Innovit UK, I don't think people know about this very much. They run a loan scheme after you've done your innovation. You can actually, so they that they become an investor in your business, and you can borrow anything from hundred thousand to a million to commercialize your product. Payback terms is ten years, uh, first five years interest only, and allow you to come in. I think it's about three point seven percent interest rate. So that's that's a picture of a good angel investor it's a government as an investor you've got to pay your money back but it allows you to get into the market pitfalls are a bad one i work with a client he had a business in um, developing car components and bike components he had investors to come in to support the business and he worked out within 18 months of it he walked away from the business because the investor wanted a seat on the board he wanted to be chairman which he agreed to because he didn't know any different and it wasn't his business anymore. He had to walk away from it. And it took him five years to redevelop his a new business and get to the levels he was before. So it's all about being wary of what an investor wants. It's, it's the right match, I think, is key. It's uh, Sometimes it's better to go for multiple investor investors working together, taking a, a, a small amount from each of them so that one doesn't have overall control. I think that's that's maybe something to look at. And, and how do you how do you go about finding an investor? So a question that I think uh, our listeners are bound to have. Great, right, we 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 don't want too many, or we don't want, or we want more than one. But then we don't want to be too big. But if we've got a product that's ready to go to market, how do you start? Would anyone like to pick that one up? Well, if, if I may jump in there, Tom, you know, it's it's other than the idea, it's probably one of the biggest decisions that you're going to make. Um, it's a little bit like getting married because now your success is going to, you know, and your failures are going to be felt by both of these, these two entities and, and how well do you really know each other? And that's why I definitely think that, that uh, what Stephen is talking about 
in terms of looking at the, the grant funding opportunities, I'd explore all of those things first. My choice of a collaboration partner would basically come down to one key thing, and that is more than just the money. In other words, what expertise or abilities is this partner going to give me that's going to help this business be more efficient or better or you know, have, have a, a stronger commercial outcome? And I think that's often the thing that we don't look at is when, we, when we've got this great idea, and as Stephen said earlier, it's this best things in sliced bread. So there's a hunger, there's a desire, there's a drive, there's an energy. We just need to get to market fast. We need to make it happen now. Otherwise, someone's going to pinch my idea and all these things are kind of running through your head. So you go for the quickest route to market. It's not mm -hmm. always necessarily the best way of, of doing it because in your haste, you land up taking on maybe other problems that you hadn't anticipated. And it's often, I think, just an opportunity to step back, but to look at your innovation, um, you look at your funding partner and say, I see synergies here and also a meeting of the minds. Do we understand each other? Do we have a similar ethos? Like, for example, in a lot of the businesses that we develop are very um, social entrepreneurship, um, social enterprise orientated. If you're going to go with somebody that's really sort of rigidly um, profit orientated, you're probably not a good fit. And I think finding those those personality traits that are similar within organizations is also pretty key. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, that the, the ethical investor is really important, isn't it? And uh, something that um, I know that we're doing at Active Gloucestershire is working with social investors to invest in uh, sports facilities. Um, they obviously want their money back, but they're looking for a social impact from their investment as well, which is which for some investors is really important. Um, Nick, you must have worked with quite a lot of companies that they're, they're not looking for external investment, but they are trying to win that battle internally. Someone's got an in idea internally and they're, they're trying to take that forward in the organisation, but have got to take people with them. And some might be thinking, well, is this something we should be putting our money into? What, what advice would you give them? Well, um, it would be just comes down to John's previous point about getting qualified people in to help you with that with that process there's many there's many businesses well everyone's got everyone's got ideas everyone's got ideas um and you know going going back to what Stephen said around some of the best ideas come from the shop floor um but really it's about if you don't have a clue well, so that sounds very disparaging but if you don't have um, an understanding of how to move those ideas forward within your organization then they can become trapped and as a consequence you end up building a culture of you know, we do have loads of great ideas, but nothing ever happens with them. So we're just going to continue doing business as usual. And so I think bringing in outward expertise to help you with that is isn't is necessary, in my opinion. There are lots of businesses that do do it well themselves. Um, but if, you know, I work with some of the biggest businesses in the, on the planet and they hire me in to help them do it. So I think, um, you know, they've, they've got to similar... This, they face similar challenges as well. Can so I make a comment on, on yeah. what Nick was just talking about, if you don't mind, Tom? It's just one of the things that struck me the other day. Um, I was thinking about a golfer when the golfer goes out to onto the course. Um, and take, take a top golfer. Tiger, I know he's in the press for a couple of the wrong reasons at the moment, but he's somebody that I absolutely adore in terms of his his approach to the game and the way he the way he plays his sport. But if you look at him, the amount of expertise that he leans on before he walks onto the field, and I think it just speaks exactly what, what Nick's talking about, is finding that, and John is also referring to it, but finding that those right people, those external things that can come in and give you that little bit of edge, that little bit of difference that you're going to need, because it's extremely unlikely that you're going to be able to develop that within the culture of the business on a on an ongoing, there's going to be some staleness that's going to have to enter into that business at some point in time. And I think exactly what Nick was talking about of bringing in those external creative ideas, go for it. Don't be, don't be scared to collaborate. Don't be scared to bring on the experts because there'll be ideas there that will, even if it just gets you thinking a little bit about your business, it's going to be money well spent. That's yeah, great. I got a very good example of that. Um, I worked with a 50-year-old trading company five or six years ago. And we did a brainstorm session. We had all the senior team in there. And it was like, well, what are we going to talk about? Because it's a 50-year-old training company. They should know their business inside out. We were 20 minutes into this brainstorm, and the ideas were very poor. We weren't going any far. And there was this young graduate they'd taken on. She'd only been with the company three months. And she came out. She said, what about that idea for self-aware uh, training services in virtual reality? And they all looked at her and said, oh, no, no, it'll never take off. And we said, I'm going to let's listen to it. So we started to draw it out. 
and it was one of the best ideas I'd seen for a long, long time. She wasn't allowed to take that forward. The company stopped it. So she left and set her own business up to do it because <laughs> the idea was right. She couldn't get it to work with the people in the team. And uh, so it's, it's just one of those circumstances. It was going nowhere as a, as a meeting and suddenly this idea popped up nowhere. It's that little nugget that somebody's got tucked away in their head and they've just got it there and just comes out in the right, right sense. Somebody said to me, there's never a bad idea. It's all about timing. If she's still around, Steve, do introduce her to me. Um, <laughs> more generally, investment thing, I mean, that's my, my world now is really yeah. related to investing mm. into entrepreneurs. So I will just confirm that boring as it may seem, time after time, you're looking for evidence that the fish will bite. You've got, exactly. the, orders, you've got the letter of intent. You've got the friendly, you, you can take the reference from the people that will... Uh, by it. You've got something there. Without it, it's pretty hopeless raising money, really. And I agree there that I'm pretty much talking business to business um, stuff, not exclusively, but it's more that uh, way. The other thing I just say in that regard is that uh, clearly there's other things um, around for an investor to invest. Uh, and one of them is the ability to execute. What's the potential versus the ability to execute? And a frequent thing that happens with the inventive mind, um, pretty often the technology guy and so on, is that, and this invention can be used, I'm using the term loosely, we could do this with it and we could do that with it. And you kind of end up saying, as a friend to them, stop telling me all the things you could do, tell me what you will do. Yeah. Then, yeah. having said that, get it out to the market in the way that Nick illustrated, um, take along your minimum viable product, whatever it may be. There's a book here, um, Get Into Plan B by John Mullins, a sometime London Business School uh, professor. The number of occasions I come along, you know, I've got this, I've got this great invention. It's a glass that holds water. Well, I don't actually want to buy that. I told you, if you could do one that held wine, I might be interested. Oh, I don't do wine. I only do water. So from that sort of experience of plan B, um, there comes the, the, you know, the, the term that's come in, well, in the last decade is pivoting. And every other business that I see, especially around the London tech bubble, is pivoting from B to C to D to back where they, they started. It's a, it's a key decision, isn't it, as to whether you... You have that faith and you work with what you've got, you adapt it or in, or actually go on to a different plan. With reference to investors, I think I'm right in saying that Mr. Musk isn't really the big innovator or isn't didn't start Tesla, did he? He muscled in. He muscled in on the engineers that kicked it uh, off. And um, much as I serve on venture capital investment committees and so on, and have been appointed by them, yeah, Luke's so right. Don't take them or anyone else unless it's absolutely the right thing for you. And if you go to a certain scale, you don't make steelworks anymore, do we? But if you've got it, if you need, a, if you need, I don't know, a large item, you, one way or another, you're going to have to make the case and go to a relevant institution. But I'm massively in favour of um, angel investors. Uh, on the investors' side, I very much dislike the idea of the entrepreneur dividing and ruling. I'd like them to get together in some sort of syndicates and have some sort of decent voice and protection. But to the extent that this is any sort of um, directory for our audience, then um, if you're interested in ethical investments, you've got the Green Angel Syndicate, which I think is really well run. You've got um, Angel Academy, which is about women uh, entrepreneurs. Um, you've got Clearly So, which certainly does a, a lot with agricultural and um, Afro-Asian uh, ventures, uh, Luke. And you've got clumsy, clumsy acronym, UKBAA, United Kingdom Business Angels Association, which is pretty much a directory for all of them, really. And uh, last but not least, um, yeah, I'm on the investment committee of something called the Angel Co-Fund. And that's, um, we'll put in between, um, it's a hundred million pound fund, it will put in between a hundred thousand and a million initially, alongside an angel syndicate. 
And what we're seeing more and more there is you've got the grant money coming in, in the way that Steve has described. You've got the grant money there, conditional on raising other investments. And there, for any of you that have thought about angel investing as being limited to you know, family, fools and friends, it's fairly small uh, money, um, yeah, you can certainly go well past the million mark in the angel, angel market now. There are pros and cons, but generally that's a lot friendlier and more likely to be compatible than the sort of uh, dystopia that Luke painted to us. I'm, I'm afraid, uh, I know Steve wants to come in, but I, I think we're, unfortunately we've, we've reached the end of the session. That's what I'm saying, I, I've, got to, I've got to duck out, I have got to right. duck out. So, so thank you everybody for, for listening. I think some of the most exciting and, and tuning in and, and watching, exciting things is, um, that I'm going to take away is that um, is what you can learn by listening to others. And it was great to watch people on the panel taking notes as others were speaking of all. I'll, I'll take that bit of advice. So let's, let's, list, let's do that. Let's take that away. Uh, be brave. You know, make those decisions. Try some of these things out and be prepared to ask for help. And you can contact any of the panel members if you're interested in asking for some help. Um, but most of all, the thing that I'm going to take away is that innovation is fun. It's really personally rewarding and it's something that we can all do. So thank you very, very much. Thank you to our panel members and uh, thank you to everybody involved in organising and inviting us to this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.